Hey guys, welcome to the Masters of Modern podcast on the MMCast Network. We are a Magic the Gathering show talking about the modern format and each of the most awesome adjacent formats in Magic. We're brought to you today by the House of Modern, our unbelievable Patreon. That's patreon.com slash the MMCast. Please comment, leave your thoughts below, hit that notification bell, and subscribe if you want to keep getting updated on what we're doing here. And of course, follow along on social media with any of the relevant accounts. The information is in the description below. Thanks for tuning in, guys. We'll see you on the episode. Welcome, kind of back, to Masters of Modern. I am your host, Alex Kessler, uh, here with a guest host, Mike Lawton, and uh, you'll notice that we're in a different location, and we're recording this through the power of Skype, which hopefully Marshall will be able to edit down so it's just our faces and not um, all of this extra extraneous Skype buttons that are around. And if you, it doesn't happen, then you don't know. Um, we are uh, in the middle of the coronavirus situation, uh, so we are now recording the podcast remotely. This is the first episode of that and we have a special guest to kind of go through some things because it's relatively relevant to the situation everyone was in and we had this really cool idea and Mike has uh, thankfully agreed to help talk through it. Uh, Mike is a uh, is Mike uh, Wildspeaker on Twitter at Mike Wildspeaker. If this is video, it'll be there. If not, it's in the description of the episode. Uh, Mike teaches science at Milwaukee Public High School and has ran a game club for seven years. Uh, Mike has played Magic since 1997, is a big fan of both Modern and EDH, and also apparently a big fan of the show. Uh, say hi, Mike. Hi, what's up, Alex? Happy to be here. And everyone else. Uh, <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so I guess before we get into, like, kind of magic, or I guess to tell everyone what the subject matter is before we get into that, uh, one thing, uh, this episode is still definitely brought to us and you and everyone by our patrons. Uh, big thank you to the House of Modern Nobles. These are the people that are paying at the, like, high-end tier. Uh, they get, like, special cool shout-outs every episode. Andrew Kelso currently is leading the pack there. Thank you so much, Andrew Kelso. Uh, we also... Uh, just a big shout out we do uh, especially during this period of time we're going to be doing live streams Ben figured out how to do uh, Magic Arena on his computer we should all be very proud of him he had to use C++ um, to figure it out which was hilarious for me a person who knows that Ben doesn't know what a computer is <laughs> uh, two uh, I'm at Kesco or twitch.com slash twitch.tv slash Kesco uh, we're podcasting you can find us on the internet all that shout out stuff happened being the podcast so make sure to check that out um, and it's all in the description below as well. Um, I'm at Kess Wiley on Twitter. All of the shout outs done. Um, so uh, for people listening and unaware of what's going on, so we decided that um, we wanted to try, you know, right now due to the coronavirus, a lot of school has been canceled and a lot of uh, kids are stuck at home. Parents are stuck with their kids at home, not knowing uh, what to do with all of this free time that they now have. And we realized that Magic the Gathering is one of the better... Um, Ways to spend time. I don't know if uh, this is your experience, Mike, but I assume it sure is, is of going to any Magic tournament and being like, oh, yeah, I'll play a game. Seven hours pass by. And you're like, oh, I've just done a thing for seven hours straight and I didn't even notice. So Magic is one of the better ways, I think, in my life that I've like noticed time escaping me. Um, and it also has a lot of really good educational purposes or, or tools to, to it. And it's great for problem solving and all these other things. Um, and there's a lot of really cool creative ways you can do it on a pretty much a budget. So we figured we'd kind of do a like guide to how to teach your kid how to play magic, why you should play magic with your kids and, and et cetera, et cetera, for parents out there, uh, as well as anyone who's maybe stuck with their significant other or doing something at home. So kind of like a tool episode of how do you play magic and how to teach someone new to magic, that especially if they're younger skewing and you being... Uh, a teacher who runs a game club and has run it for seven years on kind of getting kids into magic, uh, we figured would be a great source of information on the subject matter. Yeah, totally. I've taught my 10 year old daughter how to play magic. I plan on uh, progressing her skills in the game uh, over our uh, break here away from school. And I've taught hundreds of people at my high school game club how to play magic. So uh, it's, it's definitely a skill that you really need to pay attention to the approach you're taking so that the person you're teaching is having fun and getting into it and following along. Awesome. 
So I guess, and, and at the very end, I want to talk a little bit with you about Modern, because I know you're also a fan of the cast and Modern and all those things. Um, yeah. There's some black-white smallpox deck that you want to talk about, which sounds sweet. Um, but let's uh, let's kind of get more into the, the, the editorial subject at hand, just especially for people that are finding this video, hopefully from the perspective of like, oh, what do I do with my kid? Oh, Magic the Gathering, what's this? What is Magic, and why is it great for kids and parents alike? Yeah, so... If you listen to this, you already know what magic is, of course. Uh, I, I think it's an awesome game for so many reasons. It it works on a lot of mathematical skills, problem-solving skills. Uh, and one of the big benefits, I think, running it at my school club and teaching my kids is a lot of the soft skills associated with it, kind of social skills. It's a competitive game, so it's it's has all the benefits of tenacity and problem solving and self-improvement and this the always improving mindset that you're going to get a lot out of in as a competitive pursuit or you could take it you know as a casual pursuit in a way of self-expression you can design the heck out of your decks and really get into the art and the vorthos and any of those kinds of things there's tons of avenues you could take in this vast game and if it's uh you know, there's a lot of positivity that you can get out of any of those kinds of avenues, however you go about exploring the game. Yeah, I mean, and this is for, for people that don't know what magic is for, for parents that are maybe trying to tune in this first time. Uh, and, and even for people listening, like, think about just like the amount of words I know because of Magic the Gathering that I wouldn't have done oh, for yeah. an SAT written essay. <laughs> yeah. uh, the, like the amount of just like quick at math and from a younger age skew, just like, multiplication, addition, subtraction, just like being able to have to do combat in magic just kind of has forces you to master those skill sets from a pretty young age. I mean, I think that's, I started playing magic when I was in the third grade, which I believe is 10 years oh, wow. old. Uh, yeah. Now at the time I started with portal. So words that were not the same in portal and magic, I had banned from my tables. Uh, our yeah. listeners know that I didn't know what the word library was referring to. I thought it was your sideboard. So like giant or uh, rampant growth was banned. <laughs> it's only for tournaments where you have a sideboard. Yeah. Yeah. Nowadays, that's actually like what I can imagine a rampant growth being printed based on the use of wishes these days of just like find yeah, a basic yeah. land from your sideboard, put it into play. But uh, yeah, so I think like just as an educational tool, it's something for kids that like is really fun. Uh, like that that's the other thing is I got into magic not at all thinking about the educational purposes at that age. Uh, I was there for um, you know, there's cool dragons fighting cool wizards, fighting cool sphinxes that I then get to play black mana that has skulls on it, and so it's cool, but like relatively safe. <laughs> yeah, that's um, the hook in for especially for for younger folks. You know, you might you might be teaching. Uh, your kids, or you might be teaching a you know a roommate or a significant other or something like that, while you're while you're sitting here indoors. Um, and I I think the uh, as far as tools to use to get there, the welcome decks I think are the are the best jumping in product. Uh, you want to start at a really really base level with it with the lowest amount of complexity. Um, and if you don't have any of those sitting around or you don't want to go to an LGS to get some, you can just go through your bulk and make uh, some, you know, monocolored decks out of a bunch of vanilla creatures and, and you know, French vanilla creatures with, like, flying and first strike and, you know, a couple of interesting things like that. Uh, pack up and go. Yeah, so, like, if, so those who don't know, Wizards, for every core set, I believe, is when they release them, yeah. uh, releases these starter decks. And they're freed at most LGSs. I, I guess some might pay for them. And I would imagine that buying them online, you might have to pay shipping and handling, um, and if there is a resource to get them online, we will link them in the episode notes. Um, but they're basically these one color decks. Now, are they are two colors now? It's a uh, two colors in yeah. a pack, so you can play them against each other or shuffle them up, make a two color deck. Cool. Way. So yeah, so it's it's these packs that basically have playable decks that come inside of them, but they're they're specifically built to be kind of the easiest version of how to play, and like all of the rules have reminder text on them, so every like. You know, you don't have to look up what trample is, which is a mechanic that lets unblocked creatures get through with damage. Or you don't have to look up what flying is. All the cards kind of say that on them. Plus, yeah. there's, like, some cool splashy mythics that are or rares that, like, are really cool. Like, a dragon, like, the base things of the game. But they're, they're specifically meant to be a great onboarding experience for new players and young players. And that's the beauty of Magic is the, the base rules that you need to get going aren't that vast. 
you need to know the phases of the turn, you need to know how combat works, but all the cards say what they do on them. And so once you have a basic structure of how the turns go and how you win and lose, yeah, what an instant does, what a sorcery does, what an enchantment does, what a creature is, once you got that, you can you just go, right? And as every card explains what it does. So you new uh, turn rule situations come up and you figure those out, but every card is always saying uh, what it's doing on there. So you don't need to have this huge compendium of, of knowledge. It's not like a Dungeons and Dragons book worth of stuff that you have to have, you know, in order to just get rolling. Yeah, it's it's like, what's cool about Magic 2 is like all the pieces work together, right? Like it, yeah. the thing that really got me into Magic more than just all my friends were playing in, in, in middle school with, or in elementary school was like to be able to create something, right? What you do is you get this set of cards and there's thousands of them available, but you know, when you get started, you'll have a couple hundred at most and you can interchange the cards with each other. You can put whatever you can discover the fact that these things work in different ways. So there's these really cool moments of discovery uh, within yeah. the game that like just are very encouraging and, are like kind of one of the reasons that it's so great and reusable, right? Like that's, I think one of the tools that's needed right now for kids that are stuck at home is things to do that have replayability, right? Like a, a, a basic jigsaw puzzle. Yeah. Once you do it, you're done. So if you want to be a jigsaw puzzler in this time, you're going to need like 30 of them, <laughs> <laughs> but magic, you know, once you're done with your first couple games with the deck you made, you can take those cards apart. You can take the red cards from one and combine them with the blue cards from another. Um, and, or you can buy more packs like online. Those resources I believe are still shipping. Um, so there's, there's definitely a lot of different tools to be able to just kind of keep playing and then reinvent the, the the game every time you play it. Not to mention, you know, Wizards, uh, the company that makes Magic, uh, has a pretty wide breadth of, like, Magic is a bunch of pieces, and there are 30 different and maybe infinite different games that use those pieces in different ways, right? So the classic way is tournament mode. That's me playing 1v1, but there's multiplayer. If you have four kids, they can all play fighting against each other. Uh, if you have um, different... Uh, if you have just one player or if you have two players that are playing each other but you only have a couple packs, there's ways to play with those uh, products that are different than you naturally play Constructed. There's Sealed where you take six packs all together and shuffle them together. There's all these different ways, depending on even on which product you pay for or you're able to get your hands on to play. And like when I first got on the Magic, I just got a bunch of bulk and me and my friend just like grabbed the cards we liked from that bulk. And bulk is a term for just like random Magic cards. And just, like, built decks out of that. So there's not even, like, a structure that, like, oh, if you're not playing tournament level, whatever, you can't play. You The largest category of players in the world is people that are just like, these are the cards I own and I'm playing on my kitchen table. And right now, we are all playing on our kitchen tables. <laughs> um, yeah, you don't need to yeah. get too hung up on the, the formats and what, you know, what is legal in that. Uh, just get a bunch of cards have fun making new decks out of them, putting them together, rearranging them, and just play with what you got, whatever that is, if it's a big, vast collection, or if it's just, uh, yeah, a few hundred cards, then, uh, you know, it's everything's interchangeable. You can play with what you got and change around what you got, and, and just it's infinite. Now, if you're going out to a store, you're looking on, like, Walmart.com or, or Amazon or wherever you're wherever we can buy product at this moment. <laughs> yeah. um, obviously, the welcome decks are like a first great onboarding tool, though if you can't get those, just like any amount of packs, just buying 10 of them and shuffling all the cards together will probably get you pretty far. I will say if you could find core set based product uh, for, new, for, for new players, those are sets that are generally designated towards beginner players versus something like uh, the most recent set, which is Theros Beyond Death, which has slightly more complicated mechanics in it. Um, yeah. Net, after those those dual deck, after those intro decks, there's these uh, upgraded as Planeswalker decks. So these are products that are next, like your first deck that you buy is this insular item. These are things that uh, come with the flagship characters of the story, uh, Planeswalker cards. So they like there's these big, cool, flashy characters. Um, and are kind of the characters that you'll start seeing in more and more card art as characters get into it. So it gets you really into the story and the world that's in Magic. Um, and then from there, you start kind of building your own and, and taking all the cards you get from your starter decks and the packs you open uh, and your Planeswalker decks and any other packs you get or random cards you're able to find. There's a bunch of places selling bulk right now um, for this purpose. Yeah, so there's just there's a lot of tools out there to be able to get started, and then and then you get into the world of creativity, right? This is my favorite part of magic, which you can build whatever you want. 
It, yeah, I'd say the Planeswalker decks are the best place to start if you're learning the game, if you're trying to teach someone the game. Uh, as far as what you can buy, you know, an LGS is supposed to give you those welcome intro decks for free. Uh, but if you go to a Walmart, uh, the Planeswalker decks are like one or two colors, and the complexity isn't to the max. It's uh, a bunch of cards that work well together in a, in a basic strategy, and there's you know a lot of strategies in the game of Magic. You can try to win really fast by killing your opponent before uh, they can really get their strategy going, or you can play the long game and you know uh, try to have really expensive cards that'll take you many turns to to get going. Try to win that way, uh, and anything in between. So uh, those those decks are built to show you a strategy that you can start to work with and tune around and learn how it goes and start to put your own personal takes on. And yeah, and one of the reasons we're kind of recommending these products is because Magic can be a very complex game if, if you're just starting out or learning it or you're teaching someone who's trying to learn it from the beginning. You don't want to start with, you don't want to start with like tuned competitive EDH decks where every single card is totally different. The mechanics are obscure. Sometimes there's a Japanese card thrown in your commander deck. Yeah. You, want, <laughs> uh, you want to start with uh, uh, you know, decks that like have onboarding mechanics focus on interaction and creature combat, the, like the, the key components of the game. And then as you kind of step up in complexity, you ramp up slowly as you have more and more cards and they learn more and more abilities. Um, you know, the, the Wizards has done a good job on trying to like have a st based product line that like every product you get upgrades the complexity, starting with these intro decks and going all the way up to the commander pre-cons. Um, and... The, but the idea is there are a lot of tools just to get kind of get started. And uh, as you said, there are – everything's written on the cards. Every card says what it does. <laughs> if you, if you yep. read the card, you can most of the time, avoiding weird, uh, archaic mechanics, get a pretty easy grasp on what it's doing in the game. How – if you, I had never played Magic before or I was a parent who had never played Magic before or I'm a parent who plays Magic but wants to teach my kid how to play Magic who has never played before – how do how do I start? Where do how does that process go? Yeah, so I, I've taught magic magic hundreds of times to teenagers at my high school game club, and uh, and also adults and other folks. Uh, the thing I always start with that I think is the most elegant, beautiful core concept that makes magic unique is the color pie. I explain what the color pie is, and I have the the five welcome decks when I do it so they get to pick out what color they want to play and so whatever product or cards you have available you can sort them into those five colors and explain what the color pie is and you say all right so one of the colors of magic is white and white is all about healing and protection and civilization and soldiers and all right red is all about chaos and fire and emotion and destruction and you just explain what the color pie is and and then let them pick out whatever color that they want to play and that's one of the things that's really cool about Magic 2 is you instantly, before you even play the game, you've made a choice that is personally meaningful to you. In a lot of board games, you're just, oh, I'm the blue meeple. Okay, whatever. It's all totally interchangeable. It's just irrelevant, right? Uh, but in Magic, you have this emotional connection to the cards you're playing and the style you want to play. And whatever... Uh, Whatever speaks to you in the game, you can play for that reason. You know, maybe you're a really spiky player, and, and you know, the uh, you just want to know, uh, oh, what's the best color, right? Like, yeah, <laughs> and they ask you that. Well, then you, you know, then you might be kind of dealing with the spike there. If they say, oh, uh, what color has like zombies in it, and then you'd be like, oh, maybe you're kind of a Vorthos person, and and you know, you could be playing for that reason. Or what, the 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 color pie has all of these this universe of things to it and it's one of the most elegantly designed things about the game you know there's every color has two allies two opponents and you can mix and mash them however you want so explain what that color pie is let them pick out a deck and then start going into the rules from there yeah and so and so for people that don't know the whole color pie you explained red and white uh the other three colors are blue which is kind of focused on mind magic and water creatures it's uh, based on islands uh, you have green which is based on growth and ferocity and um, kind of the nature in general, which is based in forests. And you have swamps, which is about death and uh, uh, destruction and is in the swamp part of the, the, the color pie and, um, and greed. And those are kind of the five main colors. And through that and all of the worlds that Magic has visited, you have a pretty wide 
Vorthos, which is what you mentioned, which is like flavor, the story options. So someone's like, I really want to do Egypt, even. You know, we, there is once you get into magic, you can look at the plane of Amaket. Or I really want to do zombies. Zombies are a pretty featured tribe of the black uh, part of the color pie. Continue. <laughs> uh, okay, so the I let them pick out their color that they want to play. You start with a monocolor deck that keeps things sort of simple. Uh, and then I explain the basic rules as minimally as possible. So if, uh, I, I teach uh, tapping your lands in order to cast spells. I teach how combat works, which is probably how you're going to win or lose the game, is by attacking with creatures and taking damage, bringing their life down to zero, uh, or vice versa. Um, I explain the phases of the turn. And even in that, I skip a whole bunch of stuff. You know, there's a phase called the upkeep. I just skip that because it doesn't, you know, don't teach it until it comes up, right? Draw your card. All right, put down a land. Now you can use that land to cast a spell. I can maybe attack you if I want to attack you or just sit back and then I'm done. And I, I skip anything that is not important to just get you going as quickly as possible. It shouldn't take you more than five or ten minutes for those first set of rules because your your attention span is not going to last for much longer than that. You're not going to remember all these nuts and bolts of the game and you're probably going to get bored. And if someone's just explaining you rules for 30 minutes, you're not really having fun, right? And so you're not going to be into this game because uh, you're just getting bored and it just seems overwhelming. So teach these super basic things and then just go. Just play an open, open-handed open game and uh, explain everything kind of only as it comes up. Yeah, I think I think that's something that's really important is and and something I've done badly in trying to teach people magic in the past is there's a lot of minutia that can be learned about it. There's a lot of yeah. depth that you can get into. You don't need any of that when you're learning. You kind of need you draw a card at the beginning of a turn, you can play stuff, you get to attack, you can play stuff and then that's the end of the turn. Like if you have those yep. four basic modes, you're good on the like basic ways of how things happen you know the the combat you can get into here's all of the different keywords and here's all of the different things but in reality you just need like this is power yeah. this is toughness you when say you're going to attack right? and you're going to block and that's all you need and yep. like being resisting that urge to like also teach strategy being like oh you should attack with that or you should play this card right now um, is also something I've I've learned is not what you should be doing because people will learn those things. That's part of the, the the fun of learning how to play this game is discovering those strategy moments. But when someone is telling you how to play, you sap a lot of that fun out of the game. Yeah, uh, a real danger is over explaining what your opponent should be doing. The learner of the game as you're teaching them the game, because the, they're there's so many things you could be doing that's obviously a suboptimal play, but nobody likes, you know, kind of taking the back seat and you take the wheel and make all their choices for them because that's the best thing to do. So one of the strategies I like to do is really over explain everything I'm doing and then just let them make whatever choices they want in the game and then explain their consequences and let them sort of revise their decision or backpedal and redo uh, whenever they want. So on my turn, I'll say, okay, uh, I'm going to attack you with this angel that has flying because you can't block it and you have no choice but to take the damage. But I'm going to leave this soldier untapped. I'm not going to attack with that. So that one can stay on defense. And I'm just way over explaining everything I'm doing. And they're sitting there watching, seeing the strategy and, you know, going, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, cool. I see that. You know, and then they get to their turn and they, so say they swing in with something that you can block and kill and they're not going to benefit. And so just don't tell them they should do that. Don't tell them when to attack or block or what spells to cast and just let them go in there and make mistakes if they make mistakes and say, okay, well, I could block this creature and kill yours and I don't lose anything. And then let them think about that. Uh, oh, okay, I guess I won't do that. And, no, no, no. and you know, uh, don't. nobody likes being bossed around, right? That's no fun at all. Let them just make their own choices and explore the game on their own and over explain what you're doing and use that as the main uh, teaching part. I would say the two coolest parts of magic are choice and discovery. We've talked a lot about both of those at this point, but to kind of reiterate again, like you can choose which color you're playing. You can choose it literally down to every single card in your deck. And you get to discover as you play these cards together, cool interactions. The amount of times I've played a game and I've like put three cards into play and I'm like, oh, this goes infinite. 
yeah, yeah. Or, or yeah. oh, I just broke this. Uh, I win. Uh, always feels great. Every single time that's ever happened to me was awesome. Or I felt bad because I, like, killed three people going infinite, I guess. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, sorry, uh, Kyle. <laughs> uh, and, but I do think that, like, just the ability to, like, discover as you're playing and learn is, like, this is a game that makes that a feeling feel great. Because when you learn things, it makes you better. So the, like, rewards are there to, like, get better at learning, even, versus what, you know, and other things where it's like, oh, I did my test, now I feel like I don't want to learn it ever again. In Magic, it's like, oh, I, like, by learning that these two cards are good together or that this card is bad, I win more. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So it's like... Let it happen organically, you know? Just let them... um, ask questions as they come up don't don't tell them what to do uh you know that's so easy to do because in a lot of games it's clear what the you know uh decisions you should make are but just mm, let them make their own and and, uh learn as you go plus if you're a parent trying to waste time them learning and then having to play another game to then apply (laughs) what they learned that's an entire other game you got your kid to play at which you don't have to like have them jumping off the walls. <laughs> so once you're at that point, what kind of what are the next step as far as rules goes ba- after base mechanics, the colors of magic, uh, and like costs of cards and tapping mana to pay for them? Yeah, you just gradually increase the complexity. Uh, I find it takes a real long time for players to start to build their own decks, and they're they're relying on pre built decks for uh, a long time, or their you know their teacher or the friend who. Uh, has decks that are already built and ready to go. There, there's a lot of uh, game time, you know, hours you need to accumulate before you can look at a card and decide, oh, okay, my deck's probably trying to do this, and their deck's probably trying to do that, and so is this a card I want to put in my deck? Is this going to be an upgrade, or is this going to really, you know, interfere with what I'm trying to do? Uh, you really need to be pretty familiar with the game before getting into that kind of strategic design of it. But that might not even be the thing that you're super into magic about. You know, you just might want to throw all your zombies together in a duck because you love zombies and, you know, you want to make a theme to your deck around some other thing. Uh, We've been talking about the game, like, competitively and strategically a lot, but uh, that doesn't necessarily have to be the whole point of what you're doing. Uh, Especially if you're teaching a kid, they might just be really into the art of it or the flavor of it or something like that. Uh, You know, but uh, as far as the rules, just introduce them as they go and uh you if you're teaching somebody else you know sitting at home you're probably making the decks for the most part uh as the learner is going until they've racked up uh, a lot of time playing yeah and i think i think uh, the like my onboarding experience was like buy a bunch of pre-made decks play some games with those then once you kind of learn those cards if you do want to do something to like get started with deck building or lean into stuff, me and a buddy would just draft the cards we are. We'd shuffle all the cards we had together into a big pile of cards. And then we would take turns looking at like pack, like five of them. I would pick my favorite card from there. He would then pick his favorite card and we put that to the side. So you can do different types of drafting strategies, which if you know anything from fantasy football draft or just actually magic drafting, there's like different ways to do that with two players. I think even we were just doing 15 packs going back and forth on two of them. Um, with just two players, but because it's a pile of random cards, it doesn't. It's not like a regular draft for yeah. classic Magic players, and that gets you kind of started on the idea, like, oh, I can build this. I can. I'm choosing what I'm doing, and you might end up with literally the same pile of cards that the dual deck is, because those dual deck, or not dual deck, the the intro deck is, because those are built to work together. But it's a fun way to kind of get used to. Oh, I get to select the different pieces and put them into a pile um, together. Yeah, so as you're teaching magic, one super important thing, the number one rule is to make sure the learner is having fun at all times. Make sure the learner is having fun. So if they get really sad when their creature dies, don't kill their creatures, you know? If they get really sad, if they lose, just let them win. You know, you're the one who already knows the game. It's like, you know, your your ego can uh, stay in check and you can, you know, choose not to, uh, you know, cast a spell that kills one of their creatures. And just... Uh, uh, you know, keep keep pay attention to what they're finding fun and what is not fun for them. Uh, if if you see that they're getting bored as you're over explaining rules, then really keep that in check and slow down. Uh, but also ask them questions as they go. You know, if they keep asking about more and more rules, then 
all right, cool. Feed them more rules. Get, get into this. Uh, it, you know, uh, ask them what their favorite card was after the first game you played. And if they talk, oh, I like this card because it had this sweet art on it, then you can say, oh, okay, yeah, it, here's some of my favorite artists. Here's some other cards that kind of look like that card. You know, if they say, uh, oh, I really love that 8-8 worm that I cast, and that just totally wrecked you. And like, oh, okay, yeah, maybe we, we can uh, find some of the really huge creatures that just, like, do have these big splashy effects on the game, and, and you can go into that. Uh, or if they're just, you know, uh, into the, you know, really efficient cards or that time where they destroyed two of your cards with one of their card and uh, really started to turn the game around. Oh, okay, then you can get into that, all that sort of strategy stuff. But just ask open-ended questions and whatever they find interesting, go talk about that. You know, if uh, if they look at some card and it's like, uh, oh, uh, Augur of Bolas. Uh, who's this Bolas guy? Oh, we talk about Nicol Bolas. Oh, mm-hmm. is this... He's the bad guy, and the, the the good guys are trying to fight him for like you know years and years and years, and they never quite could. And then you know he takes over this whole plane, and like there's this huge showdown. And no, no, no. If they find that cool, then keep talking about that. If they're like not into that, then you know talk about something else. Talk about how there's a pro tour. Talk about how there's cosplayers. Talk about you know the the artists and all the stuff they do. And there's people altering cards, and there's people there's like uh, you know. People making millions of dollars competitively playing. There's people making a living off of magic finance. You know, whatever they respond to, talk about that. Because it's such a vast world to this game. There's so many hooks into it. There's so many different reasons that different people play. Um, find out what that is and and take that further. And, and then they're going to love it. But if you twist their arm into you have to appreciate and enjoy the same thing I enjoy about this game, uh, they might not want to play a lot because you know you're um you know you're you're kind of having your own agenda with it you you have to let somebody organically kind of fall in love with the game here and and let that happen and you know then you got somebody you can play with yeah there's there's so many different ways to play and enjoy magic and realize that every person you know that you play magic with has come to the game at a different angle, likes it for necessarily not the same things that you like it, and realize that when you're teaching this new player, they are that person, right? They're someone else, and they might like, like, even though I love you know, graveyard strategies where I can bring creatures away from the back from the graveyard and using that as a resource. This other person might not want to even think about their graveyard ever again, but like really likes the story and wants to hear about War of the Spark and how the Avengers of Magic defeated the Thanos of Magic. Or they might want to hear about um, yeah, and MTG Finance, maybe they're like 12 and just like really into like making money, which my younger brother is. <laughs> and it's like, oh, wait, yeah. you can like, you can like play the market and like trade people for cards and then you can trade up and gain value. Like there's so many different ways and avenues for different people to get into magic that remember that, you know, that's, that's the easiest ways. Like finding the thing that this kid or this person you're playing with who's never played before has is, is enjoying the game from a base level and then lean into it. Yeah, it's a collectible card game. I mean, how many things are kids into just because they're collectible and for no other reason? You know, and that that's a huge component of the game. Even if you might not even ever have to play. You could just collect this stuff and organize your cards and do this or that with it. Uh, that's a, you know, it, magic touches so many different things that people are into, which is why it's such a vastly successful game. And, and, and I guess on the reverse end, you know, Magic is also a great game. Say you're a parent and you're listening to this out of the dark and your kid likes Pokemon or likes Yu-Gi-Oh, but you don't play Magic. You, you're you just learning about this all right now. This is a probably a game that you'll, as an adult, will enjoy more. Many adults play this game in a way that is a, extremely gratifying that you can then connect with your kid on. Like, oh, you play Pokemon cards. Here's the next step up from that. Here's the 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 next step in that direction, uh, the more advanced version of it. Or you play Yu-Gi-Oh! Here's this other thing that I can get into with you. Or Yu-Gi-Oh! and Pokemon are games that you can play. I've definitely downloaded the Pokemon card app and like spent a week just playing that game instead. So it, it's definitely also, you know, if your kids are playing these type of games, it is a game that you can play yourself. This is something that you can get into on the reverse end. Don't just force your kid to play Magic. Look at the games that they're playing and participate in what they're doing. All right. The next, the next thing I do want to talk about is uh, is Magic Arena. So, so for those who don't know, uh, Magic released a digital client. You can play it on any uh, Windows running computer um, version of Magic, and it's kind of 
everything that magic has but in a computer form and and it's it's a useful tool in a few ways one if your kid is digitally focused which i know a lot of kids are it's a easy way for them to learn it's maybe an easier way for them to learn because it, it teaches someone how to play magic uh, when you get started the way that video games and tutorials teach them so it's a little bit of an easier onboarding process um especially if you're having trouble getting them figuring out how to explain the rules as best as possible. It's a computer game built to teach someone how to play magic. Um, it's also good, say you have an only kid child or uh, you don't have the time to play magic, or if you're by yourself, uh, Magic Arena is also a cool tool that's out there um, to let you play. I mean, they, they use one of the things that started kind of this renaissance that were in, in magic uh, right around M10, uh, the core set that came out in 20. 2009 was it, it launched with a game called duels of the planeswalkers that was on xbox stores i think you could still get it on the xbox store um or playstation store and that was a very simplified version of magic meant to be kind of an onboarding experience to the game and was very insular there wasn't a lot of deck building uh you kind of just like unlocked cards based on certain characters you'd play and then play against different characters but it was built to teach new players how to play the game and, and arena has taken a lot of lessons from that version of the game and implemented them to onboard people on into into magic one of the great ways to like kind of get kids to get started with magic and then you can get into the world of paper magic which even off of that like oh wait you can play with these things i'm playing digitally but in real life i can like hold them and and, and play with you dad uh, or mom and or sister and or brother uh and or significant other uh, <laughs> and so that's definitely kind of one of the things that allows you to in, in a free-to-play way get into magic and, and in another way to kind of play it that is pretty accessible right now that's the end of the magic arena section of this podcast unless you have anything you want to add um I got kind of an interesting point to make about okay, like um, uh, even if you don't succeed in teaching the game. Yeah. So if you're trying to teach somebody magic and they don't take it and go running with it, uh, you know, just remember magic is not for a lot of people. The I, I teach magic the gathering every year at my high school game club over and over. Kids come through the door and I teach them this game and I give them some cards and, uh, you know, a significant amount of them don't come back. And uh, that's totally fine and even if uh even if that happens uh you haven't failed at anything you you might have just planted some seeds that sprout later a lot of people learn magic uh somewhat and then you know months later years later get back into the game because they have this this familiarity with it uh, hopefully they had a good experience with you and they have uh good memories of kind of learning the game and they think it was kind of cool whenever i teach somebody magic i always give them cards they have then this artifact of this experience of the game. They're probably never going to throw them away because they realize it's a collectible game and it's they're cool looking and you know they'll hold on to them. And so it just increases the chances that they might uh, pick it up later on. Uh, but even if they never do, they at least have an appreciation of what magic is. It's it's this game that uh, is still surprisingly really unfamiliar to a lot of people and. They, they see it and sometimes have this kind of condescension or disrespect to it. They're like, oh, that's like Pokemon, huh? Like, why, why are adults playing this, like, kid's game or whatever? And it, it, it's because they haven't interacted with the game at all. If you play a few games of Magic, you quickly realize just how complex and challenging this game is. You know, nobody looks at chess and just writes it off like, oh, I could do that, whatever. You know, nobody looks at the World Series of Poker and says, uh, oh, that's easy. Yeah, be like, whatever, I could, you know. Uh, but people look at that like like Magic and write it off. And if you've played the game to any extent, you'll you'll realize what's cool about it, how just how challenging it is, just how difficult it is to be on the pro tour just what it takes to design these cards and these sets and how beautiful the artwork is that goes into it and why people can get so interested in this game and participate in this big community and they'll have a much greater appreciation for that. And, yeah, and that uh, a few things that you mentioned. One, um, parents of the world that are listening to this, don't throw your kids' magic collection away. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> if they give up on magic, just hold on to it. They're... Uh, the amount of kids' collections that I've gone through as an adult with, like, oh, yeah, my mom saved this in a shoebox from back when we played in, like, 1997. I'm like, oh, well, there's $10,000 in this box. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so don't don't throw kids' collectible card games away. They end up actually being worth something, possibly, in the long run. Second, um, you know, 
Absolutely. I mean, I would even say, you know, the onboarding process for me kind of matches that, right? My dad, uh, there's people of the podcast that normally listen to know this, but my, my dad was a uh, is in the toy industry or was in the toy industry and worked at a Fifth Avenue in New York um, on the same floor that Wizards had the, their booth or their, had their offices in New York um, before they got by Hasbro. And they gave him a bunch of product. And he came back and it was like, I was seven, I think, at the time. And he was like, here's a bunch of free stuff we got you. And I was like, I don't know what any of this is. <laughs> I like looked at it. I was like, it's not like, oh, this is weird. It's like old magic book looking cards. Cool. Okay. And I put it in a closet. Um, a year later, the older kids in the fourth grade were playing when I was in third grade. And I was like, oh, I have those. <laughs> nice. And I showed up with like you know, cards from two years beforehand that were like pre whatever. And I was like, Oh, I have like way better cards than everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is dope. <laughs> so yeah. like, y- even if you teach your kid now and it's just like a cool memory of like them learning a game with their parents during the coronavirus lock in. Um, but then five years from now, it becomes a thing that kids are doing in school and they like know what it is or, you know, just like, just that is part of the onboarding experience for magic is learning like, you know, learning the base level of the game, and then sometimes it maybe becomes relevant. And then um, the other thing is, you know, even in a, a, in a smaller or a grander scale, we talked so much about, you know, when you're teaching them how to play Magic, notice what they like about the game. Is it the art? Is it how you play? Is it combat? Is it more they like figuring out a puzzle in front of them? Is it, it, is, is it the deck building? Um, is it the trading aspect? There are other games out there that say that if they don't like magic itself, but they like these specific features, there is a ton of activities and other things that borrow from magic or magic has borrowed from that then are out there. There are deck building games that are just board games about deck building. There are uh, combat based battle games that you can buy that are just about that. There is, you know, and obviously if they're interested in the story... There are books in Magic. There's there's books outside of Magic. There's fantasy properties that are out there written by some of the writers that write Magic story. Um, and so there's just, you know, it's a great tool. So it's like almost a litmus test of like, what's next? I just played this game with my kid. I just played this game with my significant other. We're stuck still in this house for days. Uh, <laughs> what do we do next? And depending on what they're interested, there's other games, there's other stories, there's other, there's other activities that Magic is a great kind of like cross-section of 80 different things that maybe you can lean into, not just in the game of Magic, but also outside of Magic. Yeah, for sure. Do a little research. And whatever thing they uh, respond to about Magic, there's definitely a back and forth of uh, other games that have built from Magic and, and how Magic has influenced a lot of other games. And and message us. At, <laughs> I'm at Kes Wiley on Twitter. I will answer 99% of people that tweet at me. If you are like, hey, my kid really liked dragons in magic but like didn't was a little young maybe for the game or didn't know what to do with it but is there like dragon stuff out there that i could like throw at them um not physically throw at them they're uh (laughs) dragons are big (laughs) um uh but or you know i'm i 100 percent may available on twitter at all times i'm addicted to it and now that we're stuck in the houses uh, i will be more on it than i used to be <laughs> um i'm assuming same uh you're at mike Wildspeaker. the name yeah. should be right there depending on how editing works <laughs> um and absolutely like if you have any any questions or any ideas on how to onboard kids we'd also love to hear different ways you got them to kind of learn how to play magic um we'd love to hear any stories of like teaching them or things that they like specifically that were make great onboarding we'd love to hear what you thought just tweet at us also the podcast is at the mm cast um anything on twitter we have a facebook group that is also probably uh, generally a pretty welcoming place as long as our mods are doing their job (laughs) um and um so and and or email if you want to do it more privately which is the mmcast at cast.co so the mmcast dot k-e-s-s dot co um is yeah i have tons of advice i can offer about uh teaching anybody magic the gathering it's something i've done over and over and i'm pretty good at by now uh yeah and at my game club uh i also have kids playing all sorts of tabletop games and dungeons and dragons and stuff like that i love talking about all that stuff the last thing is uh big shout out to magic kids mtg uh, or magickids.org. yeah they're a charity that collects people's bulk magic cards which are just uh, cards that they accumulate that they don't necessarily want and they pick those up and they turn them into uh shippable <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> uh, shippable units, and uh, I, I've uh, 
talked to them and they've sent tons of cards to my school and they've even packaged them up into ready to go decks or ready to go instant collections where you can build decks from. Uh, and so there's this awesome charity. If you have cards you're sitting on, you want to get rid of, uh, you can send them their way. Um, and I, I believe I saw them on Twitter saying, Hey, we'll ship anybody, uh, cards that just wants to get into the game. Just, uh, hit us up, let us know. Yeah, so they've, they've, you know, sent huge packages to my school, but it sounds like they'll send them just to, uh, any old residents just to, you know, uh, spread the love of the game. Yeah. They're, they're definitely a great resource for this whole onboarding process that we talked about, especially cause I, I don't know because LGSs are normally the ones that you would get those free packs for, for starter decks. Yeah. And I don't know how long every LGS is going to be open in this moment, but magickids.org is a great resource for kind of onboarding people. And also all magic community members that are, are more ingrained that are our general listener of this podcast, especially cause we're like, on the higher end of like, you just have to know how to play magic to listen normally. (laughs) Um, Like definitely if you have bulk to send them right now, if you want to go check them out, definitely see what they're doing. Any help to them, especially, you know, for this whole conversation, they're a resource that'll definitely help people out. And if you have extra bulk that you don't need, or I think they even take some amount of cash funds, like anything you could throw their way, obviously they're going to be a great onboarding tool uh, for people. And also just a great charity in general. They do a lot of different charity work. That's just the magic kid side of them. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much for being on, Mike. Uh, this episode, I really wanted to get something out this like here. You know, uh, I have a toy company. We make stuff for kids um, from dropped up balls to ice hoops to kind of other content. We're, we're a toy company um, that like active play. And, and one thing we have kind of, you know, an audience there and, and an audience on this podcast. And I wanted to get stuff out there like what to do with people's kids um, when you're at home locked in quarantine. This is a, it's it's a it's a weird time. And magic is one of the things that has brought me a lot of happiness. And uh, thank you so much for coming on and and working with me to kind of teach parents and kids and significant others and anyone out there how to get people into the greatest game in the world. My pleasure. Um, you could fa- make sure people listening uh, to like, subscribe. Uh, if you're on uh, iTunes, go leave a positive iTunes comment. Um, and um, if you're here and you're watching the video, please comment below. I'd love to hear some cool stories where you've taught someone else how to play magic um, or any other tips and tricks that maybe we missed on how to get people into magic. Uh, we'd love to hear your stories there. Um, also, make sure to follow me on Twitter. I'm at Kess Wiley. Mike. I am at Mike Wildspeaker. Uh, and the podcast is at the MMCast. Also, make sure to follow uh, the other two hosts of the podcast, Ben Bateman at Ben Bateman Media and uh, Michael Grothy at Dudder D U. Oh, I spell this wrong every time. D-U-D-A-R-D-D. Maybe a one. <laughs> uh, don't be a, There's all the social below. <laughs> Sorry, Mike. Um, and... Or both mics. <laughs> uh, and yeah. make sure to let us... Yeah, make sure... Uh, and check out um, also uh, the... Where is it? Uh, Magic Kids MTG, magickids.org uh, as a great resource. And then also below in the description of this episode and at cast.co slash the MMCast, uh, there will be a whole guide on different ways to get kids in the magic um, and ways to uh, kind of get those products, links to stores that are still delivering, etc. cetera. Um, and then last but not least, Mike, uh, where can people find you? What are you working on? What are ways people can uh, uh, interact? Yeah, I'm at Mike Wildspeaker, and I'm out there uh, tweeting about the goings-on of my high school game club at a Milwaukee public school. And, uh, yeah, follow me or DM me uh, for my uh, hot takes on the Magic community, and you can uh, support us by uh, sending your old bulk cards or any other left- leftover uh, Magic stuff, and you can give a kid their first deck, their first play mat, their first D&D book, or any of that kind of stuff. It'll make a big difference to them. I'd appreciate it. Uh, and last but not least, I will be Twitch streaming somewhat regularly during this quarantine. So follow me at uh, twitch.tv slash Kesko. Um, and if you can't find slash Kesko, look up the other things, but I'll link at that in future episodes. Twitch.tv slash Kesko. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Marshall, for editing this video. It's a little bit more chaotic and hopefully this all worked. I recorded it in many places. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and everyone stay safe. Have a good day. This has been a production of Time Traveler Media, sending podcasts into the future.